Um, Keish and I are from the National Earthquake Information Center, the NEIC, and I'll talk a little bit about our evolving view of the hazard and the losses that occurred, and Keishore is going to talk about some of the lessons learned and challenges in doing the loss model. Uh, and we're going to assume, given the time that we have, 10 minutes, we're not going to be providing a huge overview of the earthquake. We're hoping that people have, have a lot of uh, background information. We're just going to dive right in. So uh, all in all, we have some really good maps of shaking, and the distribution of intensity and, and ground motion parameters is really well mapped out. Uh, this is not how it starts. This is how things ended up. But these are particularly good maps uh, for earthquake sea size. And uh, really, from the hazard perspective, we know what happened. And that's, that's what uh, now we need to pass on to the loss estimation to see how things proceed. We didn't have to know that to start with. What we started with uh, at the NEIC was within about 10 minutes of the origin, we had a, a, exactly the right magnitude, magnitude 7.8. Shake map was released at, um, about five minutes later, and then pager was released at 20 minutes after the origin time. It was a red alert for economic losses and orange alert for fatalities. We get about three red alerts per year. So this was a big deal to send out and got people's attention right away. Uh, by the way, the magnitude and the location of the uh, earthquake was not on the causative fault. It was on the splay fault, which confused matters, as you'll see. Uh, so within uh, about four hours of the earthquake, we put in a, a small portion of the fault that we could identify, uh, and that changed the uh, loss estimates and the fatality range into, into the thousands, also still a red alert. And we got, at that point, stations from the um, Kuiri Observatory, which were distant but also provided some constraints. Uh, and then it wasn't until two days later that we got the real ground motion data from APOD. And that really changed the, the, the story quite uh, clearly, and, and we have really good constraints on shaking. You'll notice that the uh, station distribution is right along the fault. So this fault and this rupture was anticipated by at least seismologists and engineers who were monitoring the situation. So we now have very, very good records along that. Um, within four days, we started getting really good detailed information about fault offsets. And so the pattern of shaking changed from very linear segments to the complex, uh, complex uh, multi-segmented rupture that, that, uh, that uh, we ultimately ended up seeing. Now, uh, at the time of this earthquake, a few hours after the earthquake, trying to put this all together, it's complicated. There's information flowing from all different directions. You have aftershocks, you've got intensities reported, you've got PSHA maps, you have fault maps. And so it's easy to play Monday morning quarterback and look at and see what happened. But at the time of the earthquake, a few hours afterwards, we were struggling to put all this information together. So one of the things that we're looking at and one of the lessons we've learned is, is to try to look at all this information in a, in a holistic way and try to uh, render the, the noise and, and put the, uh, the fault model together as quickly as possible. If you, if you look at the time evolution of the aftershocks, for instance, you know, three hours after the aftershock, after the main shock, there was aftershocks, they were delineating the nature of the rupture, but it wasn't clear how, how that story was playing out. In fact, some of these aftershocks were obtained by going back after the earthquake and finding them in the, in the noise. So that even this is a generous view of what we saw in the immediate hours after the earthquake. But one of the things that I'm looking at is to try to put together a dashboard, try to bring together all this kind of information to come up with the cause of fault as fast as possible. And if anyone's interested in pursuing this kind of work, come talk to me. It's, it's a really wonderful, challenging problem. The one thing that we've learned from this event is that it's really important to put together the shaking uh, in, a, in a kind of holistic way. So we've put together a composite shake map, which is the maximum shaking for uh, all of the aftershocks larger than five and a half, including the 7.5 aftershock. And on the right is the contribution to the maximum shaking from the different uh, earthquakes. So this is the 7.5, the 7.8, and then in the southern tip, we have uh, the magnitude 6.3 contributing to larger shaking. So when you look at this, uh, earthquake sequence, you're starting to see a different picture than the individual earthquakes. And it becomes very important to be able to uh, use that composite shaking estimate to try to look at the total losses, which then uh, bring us into the, the range of the actual losses for the earthquake. It's also important to think of, you know, from an overall response and, and in terms of landslides and liquefaction, that composite shake map allows us to get a better picture of what the uh, distribution of, of landslides are as well. Distribution of liquefaction, again, it's the whole sequence that's contributing to these, uh, these different effects. 
And uh, the, uh, this is uh, just a, a view of the um, composite shape map at different locations. So one of the things that you can do now, and we can have the full spectrum, uh, any of the metrics that are in the shape map, we can look at different points on the map and look at the time history of shaking and the amplitude of shaking in, in full spectrum to try to understand the behavior structures and what might have caused uh, damage, whether it was a main shock or a series of shocks or uh, the distribution of these, these amplitudes. And we can look at, like I said, in, in, in intensity or we can look at acceleration uh, velocity in the spectral parameters. That kind of forensics is really important and it's something that we're working with, uh, with uh, FEMA, ATC, as well as EERI to try to put together the forensic tools for looking in the post-earthquake environment at the shaking of specific locations. And, and we call this the shake map sampling tool where you can look at a particular location, see the history of shaking in the full spectrum. And that's something that's gonna be important for uh, some of the code uh, regulations in post-earthquake reconnaissance. I'll turn this over to Kishore now, who's going to just bring us up to speed with the last month. <laughs> I'll stay up here. Thank you so much, Dave. Oh, excellent overview on defining the hazard from this earthquake sequence. Now, next two to three minutes, I'm going to spend a little bit of time about what do we know about this earthquake in terms of uh, the kind of damage it will produce and how things evolve. So, with the next few slides, I'm going to talk about uh, what page of semi empirical model estimated. James Open Quick uh, estimated, and then the similar tool uh, by LL uh, from Kanjiri University. So, in order to know the loss uh, or damage from a given region, you really need to know their building uh, inventory and the vulnerable building types in that built environment. The slide I'm showing here is the three excellent housing encyclopedia reports from EERI. They really capture an essence of a typical construction practice in that part of the world as well as how they were built, how they performed in the past earthquakes. And this is an excellent resource for really conducting any LFA mission to really hone on to what was already known and documented and what are we going to learn new from this new earthquake. These reports are essentially an important uh, bottom line for understanding and describing those buildings on the ground. Uh, like I mentioned, there are three different, uh, many different organizations try to estimate losses and damage from this earthquake sequence and we did the same you know we had a pager system which was mainly targeted towards estimating number of casualties like fatalities from collapsed structures so where our building inventory the slide is show it is a top portion is showing the our view of building uh, inventory uh, uh, from pager as well as LR and, and uh, jeff's uh, exposure data that really uh, describe the building uh, typical building types in this region. Uh, we are talking about predominantly a concrete frame buildings, uh, dual frame constructions, shear wall constructions, unreinforced masonry buildings. That's a typical fabric of the built environment in Turkey. But especially in urban areas, most of those buildings were really concrete uh, movement frame within field wall constructions. The bottom portion, basically, I don't have time to go into details, but they are basically trying to establish shaking and damage relationship embedded within each system to produce these damage and loss estimates. Uh, one important uh, emphasis I want to do here is uh, Jem has the uh, fortune to revisit the Turkish building inventory using the new data under the auspices of World Bank project. And they use that inventory and the default fragility functions to produce uh, estimated collapse and damage buildings uh, from open quake. Uh, this is a week after the earthquake using the best available shaking constraint and they are trying to estimate a uh, number of collapsed buildings. As you see here, 11,000 buildings are estimated uh, to be in that category uh, from the main shock earthquake. Uh, similar to that, uh, LR, our colleagues from Kandili also try to estimate uh, damage and losses using their own tool. LR basically uh, has uh, two possibilities. You can do a regional loss estimate using MMI-based fragility vulnerability functions as well as more detailed spectral displacement based functions for our regions where they have such data. So on the left, you see overview of the damage estimated by the LR tool, estimating about 40,000 buildings in either damage category four or five. A significant chunk of buildings are estimated to be at a little bit lower damage category. But again, these numbers, if you think about these numbers in compared to what happened, it really, uh, I'm trying to get the right message here, which is, we are all collectively 
significantly underestimating the scale and the scope of the impact that we actually saw in this earthquake. Uh, most of these models, their vulnerability functions are lower than uh, what, what really happened. So, uh, GEMS attempt to use the very uh, low ductility concrete frame even could not produce the same number of collapses. And the real, this is really the lessons here that we really need to know is non-ductile concrete frame, especially the one that experienced pan cube collapse, what fraction of those are in a given environment and how do they perform when they reach except certain level of shaking. And this is really a question that we need to hone on and get more attention to because these kinds of construction exist in many, many different countries, including some of them are right here in California. So we really need to learn from this experience. And this, this is my last slide. <laughs> I, this aspect, we have a lot to learn and a lot to talk. I won't really pretend to say that we know a lot about this, but this is really a, a, a tremendous learning opportunity like, uh, like was mentioned, that we really need to learn and benefit from what the tragic event we witnessed in Turkey. Uh, this, has, this slide shows the extent of damage and the casualties and the collapses in, in different regions. Many people really focus on Antakya in Hatay province and Karaman Marash, uh, where the second big, uh, big, big aftershock occurred. But there are other cities and towns which were also badly affected and experienced significant number of collapses. So we really have to learn from this uh, unique opportunity and improve it for the future estimate of loss and damage. Thanks.